Okay, so welcome. I'm glad you're at Free the Seeds. What a fantastic place to be, right? And this is, can we have a pest-free garden? That is a question mark, right? Big question mark. So maybe we don't want one, but for some reason we think we want one. So we got about, she says five minutes because of the tech, but once tech's up, we're going to off and running. But so before then, let's start with just some questions and get to know each other. All right, so is everybody gardening already? 100% of us gardening. Woohoo! That is fantastic. So what percentage of your food supply do you think you're growing? Not enough. Not enough, one person says. 50, nice. 50? That's pretty good, right? Way better than not. Right? I've been able to extend mine quite a bit by just changing what I did with it. Right? Instead of just put it in the root cellar or the, or the um, refrigerator, I started doing more making it into a veggie slaw right? and fermenting it. And I got untraditional. Instead of just putting cabbage in there, I put onions, pears, all kinds of stuff, apples, carrots, in the, the veggie slaw, let it pickle and ferment. And so I'm looking for a diversity, right? The more diversity I can get into my system, the happier my microbes are going to be and the healthier I'm going to be. So in that jar of fermented cabbage, there is a lot of diversity. And then those microbes are, are growing and building in there. So super easy, fun. So I'm Patty Armbrister, and I'm from uh, Eastern Montana in Hinsdale. I run a small uh, consulting business called the Agrarian Food Web. Just help people hopefully be successful in growing food and high nutritious food. Anything from big egg guys all the way down to the gardeners. Also work at a high school, seven through 12, and teach agriculture. So we wanna get into this pest thing. Hey Robin. And she's, go she's gonna get our thing to run so you can see some pictures. But I wanna talk about four pests that I get the most phone calls about and most concerns about like, ah, penny calls, like something's eating this, right? So we're going to talk about four pests, one of which is, uh, and these are no particular order, in no particular order to damage or harm or good. So aphids, flea beetles, cabbage moths, and slugs. So those are the four that we're going to address. And I guess I'll start with aphids without the pictures because you have all seen aphids, right? So most of you have seen aphids? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And aphids, I, I view them as, uh, and like most pests, or things we can classify as pests, they are an indicator of what we have done or are doing in our garden. So it's kind of a mirror. Like if you got them, they're, tell they're telling you a message. Sometimes we don't like what they've told us. And what they are telling us. So for instance with aphids, um, they can only digest your nitrate type nitrogens in the plant. That's what they can live with and they love it and they can go from 50 to a million relatively quick if you have a big enough greenhouse. So in the Sleeping Buffalo greenhouse at 30 by 96, I think we're going into the billions of numbers of aphids that it was just uh, masses, amounts, aphids on every plant, where that you can even recognize what a summer squash blossom look like. Like, what is it? <laughs> like aphid on top of aphid on top of aphid. And our nitrates in our soil, which is in our plants, that it's using, the plants look wonderful. They were as tall as the windows, but they were loaded with nitrates of nitrogen. Right? So that we need to get the nitrogen into a different form. So once that, nit that plant used up enough of those nitrates, got it through its system, the microbes started converting those nitrates to a more mature form of nitrogen. The plant can use, the insect cannot live with, right? Just blows its guts up. It's kind of like us eating too much um, toxic food over and over and over. We're getting holes in our guts. Well, that insect does the same thing, and like they just drop like flies. They're not even in the picture when that happens, and it happens at, in, at blinding speed. 
I work at this school four days a week, and the guy that was at the greenhouse, he's calling me on the phone, like panicking, like, and we had been, he'd been panicking because we had billions of aphids. He's calling, panicking, saying, they're all gone. They're all gone. And I'm like, what's all gone? The aphids. The aphids are gone. <laughs> Not like we went from billions to none. So it was, it was just shocking that, that just that switch of what that plant was doing with, those, with that type of nitrogen that the insect can't tolerate. The other thing that happened at the same time, we had enough numbers of aphids. They're sending out signals, right? You know how the plants are sending signals. These insects are sending signals too. They were sending out enough signals that the black wasp that has to live its life cycle in the aphid, hmm. they come into the picture. And they come into the greenhouse by the masses too. And they have to lay their egg in an aphid to complete their life cycle. So one female black wasp would kill 20 aphids just by her baby being incubated inside that aphid. And so they actually just mummify the aphid. You can tell the instant you have them, the aphids get a little bit uh, tan or brown color, blow up like a, like some, like a balloon. Like it blow a little air in aphid, it, <laughs> that's what they look like. Once there's a little tiny pinhole in it, the black wasp is hatched. Doesn't take long, their life cycle's very quick. But they can control a lot of aphids in a, in a really a big time hurry. The aphids were also feeding our beneficial insects. Um, the lacewings, ladybugs, a whole bunch of them that are eating the aphids. So sometimes when I see an aphid, I think, yes, I've got a, something that's gonna kind of feed my whole life cycle of my insects in the, in the environment. So they're not always considered an enemy in my situation. That's what I'm hoping to think that you guys can think too. So that we start learning how, how are we gonna live with some of these things. They're not always pests. We're gonna apply questions at the end. So maybe jot them down. If you have a question, jot it down so we can remember. So that's where um, we're at on the aphids. I do plant uh, branching sunflowers, huge ones, right? When I say a sunflower, I mean the seven, eight, Foot tall ones. I use them for wind, wind, wind breaks in my area because we have a lot of wind. Uh, they're great for edging a garden. Um, you can grow other stuff up them. You know your squashes and they're, they're the fourth sister and the three sisters of your three sisters of corn, squash, and bean. The sunflower is the fourth sister that they don't talk about. Right? So you can utilize that as a, a way to, to let the beans or other stuff grow up them. They also are like this huge beacon. You know, they might as well have a beacon light going, doot, 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 come here, come over here if you like pollen. And they bring in the pollinating insects for miles and miles around just by having them in your environment. So that's how I use them. The aphids get herded into the sunflowers by the black, by the black uh, ants. They herd them, they manage them kind of like an army, right? They control them. They'll cut the wings off of female aphid to keep the colony in place so that they can utilize them. They're eating the, the syrupy sap that they poo out. So that's all we'll talk about on the aphids. We'll move to another pest. Let's talk about the cabbage moth. How many's got cabbage moths? Right? Do you think they're a moth or a butterfly? Moth. But they are a moth. Most people think they're a butterfly. Are they native to our environment or not? They're not. So they came over with the vegetable containers and shipping crates and stuff. Right, so they're not from here. So that should be our first education signal. They're not from here, so they're pests. They're, they're um, enemies that keep them in check are not here either because they didn't import them right, we only imported the cabbage moth. They've been hugely successful, right? They're every gardener you ever talk to says I've got them. So they're pretty cool though. I think they're pretty, um, pretty easy to deal with. We just plant in diversity. And what, which uh, family of plants do they like? Brassicas. Brassicas. They actually have to have them. So this is kind of, you kind of study it. 
Study who your enemies are, if you consider the pest an enemy. Study them. They have to have the Brachus family. So they're going to have to lay their eggs on your kale, cabbage, or, or, or ca um, cauliflower or broccoli. They have to. All right. So this is a key point for us as gardeners that that's super important. Now we know that they have to have their egg get laid on our cabbage. This is important. So all we do is we plant lots of flowers in that patch of whatever our kale and broccolis are. You're not monocropping them, right? You're not going to plant one masses row of kale. Don't do that, right? So you're going to plant these flowers with them. Buckwheat, calangia are the two that I like to use the most. I'll intertwine some marigolds. I'm only using marigolds for scent, right? The more scent you get in the area and your calangia and buckwheat are growing usually above your, your um, plant family, the cabbages that we want to protect. They get those moths so confused <laughs> that they're like, what the heck is going on? They're so confused that they lay their egg on the wrong plant. When they do, their babies can't survive and they don't turn into the worms that we love so much. <laughs> they don't turn into them because they can't. Oh, this is our perfect vision. This is what we have in the winter, our perfect vision before the pests arrive, right? <laughs> this is what we think we're going to get. And then the pests show up. So this is a regenerative garden. We'll talk about that more with questions. The plant puts up a defense against of them, right? And as that plant puts up a defense against of them, the plant's getting stronger. As it gets stronger, we get more nutrition in that plant, right? A broccoli plant can handle 40% defoliation from the cabbage moth and be fine. The plant's fine. It's you that's hurt. <laughs> and your neighbor whining about you got bucks. I celebrate I got bucks because now that that broccoli is stronger and more nutritious and a better plant for me to eat than the one without bugs or holes in the leaves. So in nature, when the plants get weakened, they're not doing well, they're sending out signals too into nature. They, hey, I'm not doing well here, why don't you just come put me out of my misery? And the pests come and put them out of their misery, right? So. Usually there's an underlying problem. It's not that I just got bugs because I planted kale, right? There's usually an underlining thing. And that's where you need to know what's going on with your nutrition and get that nutrition levels right. Here's some of the um, winter squ or summer squash in the sleeping buffalo. Do you see any aphids on those? Well, they're, they are there. And we want them to be there, but they're in so low in numbers that they're not noticeable, right? Because we want to feed those beneficials. So we want to welcome them. We just don't want them to take over. Right? We want to live with them. Good place to learn this is from John Kemp with the Plant Health Pyramid. And it's uh, Advancing Eco Agriculture. So advancingecoag.com. And he's got webinars, podcasts, YouTube channel, and he'll educate anyone that will listen to him. He's the man's a genius. He's a vegetable gardener from Ohio. He's an Amish person and has turned into this incredible business of trying to change big egg and anybody else that will listen to him into a better grower. So when we had those aphid numbers exploding on us, we were, we were down here in the lower part and not up where that we was really doing what we needed to do. So one of the things that you can look at on your, on your uh, kales and cauliflowers and stuff to know that I don't have to go pay for this test to figure out if, I've, if I'm doing well or not, the plant will tell you. You just need to listen to your plants and pay attention better. So when the, when the um, cabbages get that really waxy looking coat on them, they're just covered with it. It's a great teaser for kids in the garden because they're like, what is it? It's on, it's on the fruit, it's on the plums, it's on the cabbages. So those are um, lipid and it's making a waxy coat to protect the plant, right? And when it's doing that, 
it's doing the best that it can do for nutrition, photosynthesis, and everything. You're, you're just might as well go pat yourself on the back, go celebrate. Your plants are doing the best that they can do. And you will not have pests when that's going on. So just kind of pay attention to the little, little things. Um, we're going to talk more about diversity toward the end, but this is the diversity in the Sleeping Buffalo, sleeping buffalo Greenhouse. Arch enemy number one, and it comes to no-till, is the slug. Everybody's got them, wants to get rid of them. Figure out, how do I get rid of them? This is another thing where that you just really got to dig into, what am I dealing with, right? You need to know what the life cycle is of them. Um, the more I've dug into them, I thought, wow, this is quite an avid um, um, enemy. He's difficult, right? For one thing, what sex is this one? Either. Or they're both. They're both. They don't have to go look for a mate. They just find who's ever next door. That's fantastic. That's all they need. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, yeah, the breeding cycle is like very scary and fast. Are they uh, nocturnal? Yes, they are. But if you're an early riser, you're going to be able to find lots of them and figure out what's going on a little better. Here's some damage of what they can do. Um, you really like to get your plant starts ahead of them where that they're big and strong and getting on toward the upper part of that pyramid before slug season starts. Right? Slug season starts when the, when the soil gets pretty warm and things start getting going. They are, they've got to have moisture and they don't like freezing weather. So it's going to be at that time. Yeah, they can do some ugly damage, right? So the slug traps and baits, like they talk about the beer bait. I did that. What a waste of beer. <laughs> what a waste of time that that didn't work. But I think trapping is one of the better ways to going about it because they have like 30 to 40 eggs a year. They can also go dormant and without food for long periods of time. So for us to just think, well, we're just going to get rid of them, I don't think that's going to probably happen. But what is their job? What's their real job? What, what did God put them here for? You might know? Okay, so they're, they're a primary decomposer. So if you've got something that needs decomposed, they're going to be in your system. As long as you have a wet enough system and they've got dark places for them to get to, then you're going to have them. So if you do the, if anybody at the last class where we had the six inches of compost, the finished compost is done getting decomposed. The slug now does have no job to do. Right? So they would rather go to the neighbors, especially if they're watering overhead. They'll go there and not be in yours because your work is done. You don't have work to do. If you do the live, the live uh, walkways with the uh, white clover, there's really no, no work to be done at all. So then we're discouraging them, thinking them, getting them to think, I need to be somewhere else and not here. All the work's done here. Go somewhere where there needs to be work to be done. In our situations where we built Hugo cultures and started with mulch, we're going to have slugs. Or in my experience with other people in my own, if we've set the plate for slugs, we're going to get slugs. So we, we set the plate for them and we, now we have them. My worst problem is in my Hugo culture and they love it. They're like, there's a lot of work to be done in there and for a long time. <laughs> So I've been trapping them with bait of like summer squash. Cut a summer squash into quarters long ways. I go into locations that are, they're known to like, right? Around your water source, in your hugel beds, in, uh, in places that have a lot of um, shade. They're gonna be in those locations. So I go to those locations and I'll come back to that. I will set up the summer squash and lay it on the ground and maybe put a kale leaf over the top of it. 
give them the perfect place to come, right? So this dead plant is now sending out signals, come decompose me. So they come, they come to this squash. Early in the morning, I'll take a bucket of water, maybe about not quite half full, pick up this lovely summer squash. And by the numbers of slugs on the bottom side is way more than on the top side. Put it in a bucket of water. And there's one major flaw in nature. Nobody taught the slugs how to swim. <laughs> and they are going to try to crawl out, but I just make a little swirl in there, a little vortex, and they're drowned within seconds. So now I have dead slugs in a bucket of water, right? But so I'm able to do that. I set traps all over wherever they're, where they're giving me problems. If they behave and they're just decomposing, they're, they're making me fertilizer. That's okay. When they don't behave, they start crawling up on the kale, whatever the plant is I don't want a eating, I set the trap up, right? And I start trapping there. I trap in all kinds of sizes, right? From itty bitty to great big. The great big ones are sending out signals to the little guy. So if you have a great big one and he's making a trail, he's saying, this is my area, stay away. Oh. Right, you pick him off, probably gonna get 50 little guys to show up. So I'm not saying leave the big guy, but that's an issue. They're, they're communicating that way with through their slime trail. So if you have chickens, I teach the chickens to eat the slugs, right? They're dead slugs, but I'll take them live slugs to train them to get them to like slugs. Right? Ducks love slugs, so you won't have to train your ducks or geese, but your chickens you might have to train. So I bring them a few treats, give them some live slugs. They'll catch on, and they're like, if they're expecting you to bring a worm and you bring a slug, they're gonna eat it, right? And then they get tricked, and they're like, oh, that was not a worm. <laughs> but now they're starting to eat them, right? And then I can bring them the bucket of dead slugs and they're gonna eat them up, right? They're gonna be eating them. So you turn them into something useful instead of something bad, right? So this is back to the, the pyramid where we're talking about the plants and the nutrition levels and stuff. So you can take a leaf off the plant and send it into a lab and get a, a leaf tissue test and they'll tell you exactly what the plant um, needs for nutrition. Uh, micronutrients, macronutrients, everything. So in big egg, that's what I encourage people to do, because then now we know if we need to put any fertilizer down. Instead of in traditional big egg, they just put fertilizer down, think, well, I'm just gonna cover, cover my problem, so I'll just put fertilizer down, right? That's causing all this leaching and running into waterways, all kinds of big issues. So we get them to stop doing that and then test the plant and know, okay, I only really need to put on sulfur, boron, and zinc. I don't need to put on all these hundreds of pounds of NPK. We'll catch questions in the end in a second. So that's a win-win for the environment, it's a win-win for the people, it's definitely a win-win for the people downstream that's drinking their toxic waters. For the home gardener, I'd recommend using the uh, refractometer there. When that's just gonna measure the sugars in the plant. But when the sugars are really high in the plant, they're doing lots of photosynthesis, things are going really good. Right, so you should feel really good about yourself when you can get high bricks numbers. The refractometer can also tell you if you got nitrates in the plant. And so if you got nitrates in the plant, then you'd know, I don't need to add more nitrogen. Don't be, sometimes we over love what we're doing, so don't give it more, right? We, sometimes we just need that plant to use it up, right? Use it up and get it converted. So the refractometer can help you do that. You just simply take a little bit of leaf, crunch it up, put it in a garlic press, squeeze it out, put a dribble of plant sap on your refractometer, close the light monitor and then look up into the sunlight and it will show it's bending the light rays over the sugar and you can see it in this little thing. It costs $20 on, to buy for a refractometer. And they're just, but it varies throughout the day, right? And it varies on a cloudy day versus a sunny day. So you need to kind of track, if I'm gonna do it on a sunny day, and preferably you're gonna do it at the same time on a sunny day and not on a cloudy day at the same time. Going, they're gonna be different. The plant's gonna be doing different things at different times of the day. But it's a, it's a handy tool to use. And then, of course, write down what you're finding out. That's a salary plant there that I was doing. Had the highest salary brick measurement that Nicole Masters has ever seen, which she does 
this sort of work all over the world. And so I was feeling pretty good about that. And wow, did that celery taste fantastic. <laughs> so for the layman, you can do it by taste. So if you got a plant that tastes super good and the other one tastes bland, that super good one is where your nutrition is. So in your grocery store, if they'd let us do taste us before we buy, we would have it all figured out, right? <laughs> it would not take us long to figure out who's producing X, Y, or Z and go buy from them. Wouldn't take long. You can do it with your taste buds. We talked about aphids. There's a poor pepper. Man, they love peppers. The aphids do. But the peppers were defoliated, or not defoliated, but decolonized by aphids through, the, through this nutrition thing. You see these uh, little um, tan one that looks like it's all blowed up, right? So the, the black wasp has already got her egg laid in that. And they actually consume that aphid from the inside out, make it into a mummy. So those are what we call aphid mummies. And so when you're seeing aphid mummies in your gardens, yes, things are really, really good. Right? Leave them alone. Those aphids are feeding other things. Those uh, black wasps are really hard to see. They're smaller than a mosquito. But we will see them kind of float around. But one female is doing 200, <coughs> taking care of 200 aphids. It's pretty good. You can buy them. I think there's places you can buy them. How many has got flea beetles in their gardens? This is back to the cabbage moth. Um, sorry about this. But the, the market gardeners are using row covers, and that does protect them from laying directly on their plants. So they're using them for flea beetles and the cabbage <coughs> moths. This is protecting kale. And kale, the flea beetles love kale too. So they love that whole family. But we're going to use that against them. So we'll catch on what to do. This is another great way to, to deal with insects, and this is called uh, surround. It's a clay, super, super fine clay. And so they liquefy it, and then they spray it on. And the orchards especially are using it as an a insect barrier. So for the insects, not the, not the bees and the pollinators, but the others will get that. They're trying to eat the leaf, right? They bite on the leaf. And they get that clay in their, um, in their um, breathing system, and they can't handle that. They're going to be dead, right? So it works really well. So the big orchards are really, the organic orchards are definitely doing this, moving that direction. And also keeping that tree a little cooler, too, and kind of works like a shade cloth in a greenhouse. Oh, yeah, here we are. Are they all black? Your flea beetles? Yeah, some of them are uh, kind of metallic green. Oh, and some are black. And <laughs> yeah, as I usually talk a little deeper about flea beetles, people are like, oh, I've got that pest. <laughs> uh, most people don't know for sure what they are until you can get it hammered down. But they love the sun, so we can use that against them. They love the sun, and they love the Brachis family, including our radishes including sweet alyssum, like, oh my gosh. Been fighting with them for a couple years over sweet alyssum because I want sweet alyssum in every bed, right? Sweet alyssum is the nectar source for the black wasp and all those little tiny guys, right? So there's pure organic gardeners, market gardeners that are, they're huge, like there are hundreds of acres that put, put sweet alyssum in, 8% of the field is sweet alyssum. And the other is romaine lettuce, and they have aphid zero none with just sweet alyssum, right? And they have an exterior barrier on the outside of their land that's all um, pollinating plants, perennials, and different things. So those are a harbor place for beetles and a harbor place for the insects to have a life and to do their own thing. That's what's went wrong in the, in the big scope of things is we've, un, we've removed the diversity so badly that the insects have no place to live and live out their life cycle. It's not just the honeybee. The honeybee is just the one we, we hear about and we're in love with. It's everybody else we're damaging just as bad. But this flea beetle, look at that. That is a nasturtium. <laughs> and so uh, aphids and flea beetles will be attracted to nasturtiums. And nasturtiums, if you have your trailing nasturtiums, they trail 
There's two different varieties. One trail's about four foot, another will trail six foot. I get the longest trailing ones possible. The more mass of flower you've got, the more chemicals it's putting out, and the more that it can withstand, right? They're attracting the aphids and flea beetles to them, but they can handle it. They laugh at it if the plant's big enough and healthy enough. But when they're not healthy enough, it's gonna start looking like that. And they're not big enough. The canopy's too small. You know, on your little bunch ones, they get a little round plant. It's normally not enough unless you're gonna plant a lot of mass of them, a mass of them, then you might be able to get along. But the trailing ones are so easy to grow and they're super fantastic. And they're edible too, so. What did you call that again? Trailing nasturtiums. Okay, and the mustards, so oh, they love the mustards. The radishes you can use as a, as a way to pull them away from your now not a monocrop broccoli and kale, right? You've planted flowers with them. You can use the radishes that grow super fast, plant them somewhere else. That's gonna pull the flea beetles way over there, right? They don't like to travel great distances and they wanna travel from the plant family to the plant family to the plant family to where they want to go. So you've got a whole bunch of stuff that's not related in the middle. They're not going to go travel that far. So there's a couple tactics. I like to use lots of tactics because you don't never know which one you're going to need really need in your pocket. So it's good to kind of be thinking about. So if you can, your kale likes cool, cooler weather, right? And can tolerate some shade. So put it in those locations. These flea beetles love the sun out in the middle where it's hot and dry. There's our life cycle. This is important to know because we'll have a flush of them early. It'll be usually around 4th of July, maybe a little ahead of that. And then they disappear. And you think, huh, I only had a problem, now I don't have a problem, so I'm okay. Where do they complete their life cycle? But in the soil. And that's what they're doing. <laughs> they're gonna make two or three populations of them in one year. If you have a long enough growing season and you give them enough food source. So in my area, we get two flushes of them. The early one, and then we'll get one in August. A lot of times if it's been um, cabbage, we've already harvested and they're gone and out of the scene, so they're not a problem. Your radishes are gone and out of the scene. But then, there, then there's your lovely kale, or maybe your broccoli, depending on when you planted it, and they are hammering it. Because <laughs> now they're the only family left that they could eat on. If you have those big trailing nasturtiums and they get huge, they're gonna go eat on them instead. So we're, sometimes we've gotta think, how are we gonna live with them instead of live against them or fight them? Oh, while we're in the soil, this is key, right? What's their enemy? What's that? Sunlight. Sunlight, but in the, in the plant world, remember the, the aphids getting ate by the lady beetles and lace wings. Who's gonna eat him? Nematodes. Nematodes, eat them, right? They'll eat any egg that's in the soil that's small enough to eat. So we want um, nematodes, beneficial nematodes to be keeping these guys in balance. Why aren't they in balance? Some, I don't know if the guy was in here that says they can't quit tilling, right? That we just got to, I mean, it's part of our culture and we've always done it, right? You're cutting up the nematodes every time you do anything like that. They're, they're just out of the picture, right? And they're, they're the higher order of the microbes. That means that they need everybody else up this chain of food for them to be in the environment. So when we start destroying that, they're not in the environment. So we're gonna to try to replace them in the environment so you can buy them and you can add them to your um, environment. It's gonna take time though, just like anything in nature, right? If we've whacked it out and they're all gone, we wanna start replacing them. So I would put the Beneficial nematodes on as soon as the soils get warm and put them on early in the spring and you need to water them in, right? They're aquatic creature. They can't handle sunlight, so you're gonna do it in the evening, 
and put out the beneficial nematodes in the evening. The one little box that you get is big enough to do my garden twice. So when I put half the package in the water extract for the spring, the other half I'll put in for the later fall, right? The later fall nematodes are the ones that are going to eat the spring hatching ones. The ones that put in the spring will get the second hatch or the third hatch to fall, right? So the one package, if your garden's small enough, can do you two different times, one in the spring and one in the fall before freeze up, right? So I usually do it in late summer. You're gonna apply it with a, just a sprayer and you'll take the, make sure you got bigger nozzles on, take the filters out, right? So there's, they're, the, they're the things that are clogging up your sprayer when you spray microbes. There's lots of places you can buy them and they're relatively cheap. I mean, $20, $20 or so to treat the whole garden twice, pretty cheap. And they also catch fungus gnats, a lot of flies and grubs is what's on their diet. So is it really an enemy or are they beneficial? There's a trap crop, right? So outside this garden, all the way around the garden is lots and lots of flowers. And she lets them self-seed, so she's not having to reseed them. They, they reseed themselves, right? And that's causing a trap crop, right? And helping, helping with lots of stuff, adding lots of diversity to the garden, lots of branching sunflowers. This would be considered a beetle bump, right? A beetle bump, you're gonna let it just break down in nature, right? And that leaf litter and stuff is a place where the beetles can live, right? It gives them a house gives them a place. When we mow everything, we eat everything and keep everything nice and tidy, there's no place for the insects to live. Right, so we gotta think, okay, we gotta change a little bit of our mindset. So some of which we've been using are only band-aids and we're gonna use them until our plant gets healthier and the microbes get healthier and they start working together. This is a product some organic growers use it does work, but I don't use it nor prefer to use it because it's, it's going to catch other stuff too. So it's going to catch some non-target things. But if you're, you know, your kale is your bread and butter and you have to get income off of it, then this would be something that you could use. So it's, it's organic certified. It makes our stomachs blow up too. They, and this is another one made out of wool. These are wool pellets. These are just Band-Aids, right? Hmm. So they, uh, they don't like wool at all. <laughs> so they'll just spread it down and make it like a mat out of it. I'll be sharing these with Free the Seeds so you can have them. If you got a good compost pile that's already mature and not heating, I'm adding these to that pile. Now, this is a theory, so I'm still testing it. I don't have it um, honed in all the way yet. It's in my piles from this fall. So I can test by looking at it underneath the microscope and see are they there or not, right? If they're there, then I've added them to my environment and then I can just put it out to compost. Preferably manually put it out and not, not do something to destroy them when I put it out and then I'll be adding them to the system. Once they get built in the system, I won't have to do any of that anymore, right? Nature will take care of itself. I'm just helping it. This is a surround product. I haven't found it. Well, I guess you could buy it on Amazon and get it in a small container, super expensive that way, but <coughs> they sell it in these big bales, and so usually your market gardeners and orchard people are buying it, but if you guys went together with the community garden and bought one, and then there'd be enough for 20, 30 people to share you wanted to use it. And it's just clay. Um, if you're really desperate and you've got to have that crop and you don't have this year to get this thing figured out and become a better gardener, then you can use BT. So BT is only going to get your cabbage, um, your moths and stuff. And it's natural, comes out of the soil. Thank you. And uh, but it can be abused. So we think of genetically modified corn, right? 
So what did they modify it with? Bt. Right, so it's in the it's corn seed by the masses. Do you think the insects have figured out a way to deal with it? Yes. Are they resistant to Bt? Yes. Just like we have resistant wheats that are resistant to their chemical. So then they buy another chemical, and a more chemical, and another chemical. Nature's winning. Nature's going to win the battle. We just got to figure out how do we step out of this picture, look at it from a distance, and think, how am I going to work with nature? So that's what I encourage you to be thinking and doing. So you can use it, just don't abuse it, and don't use too much. Only use it when you need it. So create your visions. Let's flag some questions now. Yes. Well, back when you started with the greenhouse and you were saying how it was overrun with mm -hmm. aphids. Aphids. What did you specifically do to kill them? I didn't do anything. Time took care of it. Right. So in the beginning, when we made our soil, we made it from this old cow manure, our uh, dead cattails and wood chips. Right, we composted it, but we, it was not a finished compost, right? It was still pretty raw, right? We built hugel beds in our beds, so our beds are as tall as these, and they're, I don't know, they must be four foot beds, four foot wide. So we put wood in the bottom, then we backfilled with the soil because we couldn't afford to put that much soil in, right? Which we call soil, it was compost. We couldn't afford to buy more, right? And we only had X amount. So we figured if we did the hugel approach of burying the wood, then we would have a wick of moisture in there. We have a wick of nutrients in there, and it's slowly breaking down over time. So that's why we use that effect. When we did, we have still got too much raw, let's say use raw nitrates for lack of better terms, available for the plant to use. So the plants are using it, plants are happy. <laughs> They're fine with it. I mean, they were so tall, they were in the rafters. We couldn't even pick the tomatoes in the rafters in the cucumbers, but there's the wrong form for the aphids. As soon as that plant used up that excess nitrogen and the microbes started converting it to a solid type nitrogen uh, that they can utilize, and the plant can utilize, the microbes eat stuff, right? And then somebody else eats them. When they poo themselves out, it's in a nitrate nitrogen form that the plant can utilize, soluble nitrogen that the plant can utilize. So then when that's all happening, the plants were using that nitrogen. That's what's in their canopy. And the bugs can't live with that. The aphids can't live with that. The aphids could live with the nitrate in the plant all day long. If we'd run the, the refractometer on it, we would have known we'd had nitrates in it, but we still wouldn't have been able to do anything. There's no magic wand. It was just time. And time for the aphids to be there and send these signals out. We're sending them out into nature. There hasn't been a garden there ever, and they're 24 miles from a garden. So we're, we're sending nature, sending these signals out to this black wasp that miraculously appeared, right? The numbers were so high that nature was triggered that we need to go in there and clean this mess up. It got triggered, they come in about the same time the nitrates dropped, and the aphids were gone within a week. And you're just like, it's just jaw dropping. <laughs> You're like, what happened? It took us a while to figure this all out. <laughs> but it's a miracle, yes. You had mentioned before sending a diseased leaf or something to a lab. Is that the lab, the scientific lab at MSU? You could probably send some there. I don't know if they're doing, um, I'm not sending diseased ones off. I'm sending a leaf to figure out if the, the micronutrients and what the plant needs, right? The plant would tell us through the leaf tissue test, so I'm not sure what lab you could use, but I would check there first to see if you could. Yes? And then I have another question. Is it a myth that um, slugs um, love beer? And, I mean cheap beer, okay? Cheap beer. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried uh, shallow boats, mm -hmm. and you know, they flock to it, so um, maybe it's not a myth. I don't yeah. know. Maybe I was just like some gardeners use yeast. Mm -hmm. So it's the yeast and the beef. Yeah. So they're using yeast because it's cheaper, easier to use. But 
zucchini works the best. <laughs> I'm using Mother Nature signals. Sure. Right. And so that works better. Cheaper. And cheaper. And I was growing zucchini in that greenhouse. I mean, I pick it when it's this long, you know, but I only can go there twice a week. So I get there and I say, <laughs> what happened? Whoa. That, what did I let go at four inches and did out 18 inches? Yes. Okay, two terms. Hugel beds and beetle mounds. Beetle, beetle bumps. Beetle bumps. Yep, beetle bumps. So beetle bumps, uh, it's an uh, area that you have reserved for the insects. And so it works really good to have at the outside edges of your property or your growing beds or on your fence line of your beds. Right? Some people, like in Iowa and stuff, they would actually build a bank, a soil bank for them. They call them beetle banks too. There's lots of names for it. But so they, they grow a mound, and then, then you put in any perennials, preferably flowering ones, but like your uh, blue brunch wheatgrass, which you guys all know, right? This is your state grass. It should go in there. So you can teach your kids that that's just state grass, right? And it has great big long, long leaves, and it goes like this in the winter, right? And it's making a place for those beetles to live. So all those plants are decomposing in place. You're not harvesting, you could probably harvest some flowers, take it to the farmer's market, but you're not going in there and wiping it out. You're giving it back to nature and letting them do their thing. You want as much diversity in those beetle bumps as you can possibly get, right? D not only just the types of plants, but the structures of their flowers. So that's why your sweet alyssum is just a rock star. So think little tiny flowers all the way up to giant flowers to be the right kind of diversity. Your carrots, that whole family is fantastic. Let them go to seed and flower and the pollinators are gonna love it. Uh, horseradish, oh my gosh. One horseradish plant will bring in pollinators that you could not possibly identify without a professor from the university. Just a second, yes. Um, on my plum tree are aphids yeah. and I noticed tiny, tiny wasps on them, like about a millimeter. Those are black wasp. Those are, okay. They're the good guys. I thought they might be good. Yes. They're the good guys. And um, probably on your fruit trees, you might think, well, are they fertilizing the lawn? Stop fertilizing the lawn. No, there's no lawn. Okay. Okay. The ants, put, the ants are putting Oh, they, there. yeah. We'll some, plant some sunflowers. The ants like the sunflowers better because it's less work to herd them in there. So you gotta think, okay, what do they wanna do? Oh, they wanna do that. So, okay, do it over here. Actually, when I planted the plum tree, it, it took the ants away from the cherry tree and they went to the plum tree. Yep. <laughs> they have preferences, you know. Yeah. Why do aphids love plum trees so much? Well, they like what they like, right? I mean, they're, probably, they're pretty specific, right, though. If I have a wheat aphid, it's not gonna harm my garden. Right, so they're all different kinds of aphids. Look them up on the internet. Tremendous numbers and different colors, and they have targets of what they like. A soybean aphid is different than a wheat aphid. Okay. Right, so, so lots of different aphids. My plum tree gets them like crazy, and I put a spray an oil, an organic oil, on them. But it, it just keeps seem to come back. And your fruit trees? Worse. Yeah. So I would check the nutrition of your plant with your leaves, especially on a tree, a fruit tree. Right, You're, it's going to live there for a long, long time. So check the plant and let, find out what it's telling you. Maybe it needs boron, right? Maybe it needs sulfur. Uh, those are micronutrients that they absolutely have to have. But if we don't know that they need to have it and we don't have enough in our soil, they're not gonna get it just miraculously. Although my dad says we used to get it from the smoke sacks, the sulfur. <laughs> yes. What are your thoughts on uh, DE, diatomaceous earth, oyster shell, and neem oil in the garden? So um, I think some of them do help with some things. I was, as soon as I learned how to run the microscope and understand what Elaine Ingham is teaching me, I'm like, okay, is that doing that to my nematode too? And my worms, I don't know, you know? So I'm like, okay, so that, you know, when, when we research something, especially the old method of researching, we're, we have one thing that we're trying to figure out. Right, and we're trying to control the environment to figure that out. Nature doesn't work that way, and out there in nature, it's, it's massive. You know, that uh, it's really hard to do. So, I don't know. 
So I, I prefer, if I can outsmart them, I do that. Yeah. yeah. Any type of sunflowers? Does it have to be a, the big ones? Or no, I just, I like the big ones because they, they're like a beacon bringing in these okay. pollinators. Right? Mm -hmm. So in this little tiny town of Hinsdale, yeah. I've convinced everybody to get off chemicals. Wow. But I'm the only one still planting lots of flowers. Yeah. Where do you think the honeybees go? <laughs> yeah. yeah, we can we can go check them out any time of the day you want to go check them out and see what we got. On uh, the MSU uh, bumblebee thing, I don't know how many bees I sent into them. And so we're helping them with identification because we're a beacon of a place. It's a place they know they can be safe. They know they got food. They know they got a place to be. And nothing's going to get in the way. Just all kinds of flowers, but particularly some flowers they like. Any other ones that are high on the list? Oh, yes. Bee friend. Facilia? It's P H A C E L I A. And it is, it's, called, it's nicknamed Bee Friend. You have more bees than you ever knew what to do with. And its flowers is just really super, super cool. Um, the, the big egg guys like it for a cover crop, but it's super expensive seed. But you as growers, you're going to have more seed than you know what to do with in a year from Facilia. And it reseeds. It's a cool season plant, so you plant it really early in the spring. And it will bloom and reseed and have another planting in the fall. Is it good for those of them who bugs or primarily for bees? bees? Anything. You're going to have lots of different stuff on them. But you're going to have all your bumblebees and all your honeybees, all your native bees and stuff are going to be working on them. Think of flowering in succession. What's the first flower that flowers in succession in our yards? Dandelion. 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 What's the first thing people try to kill? <laughs> A dandelion. If they understood the life cycle of the bumblebee, they would stop killing the dandelions. They are their food source. They've hibernated like a bear all winter long and are desperate to get food when Nature provided them food, and then we go out there and chemically whack it. Stop doing that, right? We got, it's a tap-rooted plant. It's telling you you have compaction, and you probably got a calcium problem too. So you need to dig into nature, what's wrong? They're signals. So the weeds are signals, the pests are signals. Yes? Um, so I have a huge problem in my garden with earwigs. Earwigs. Um, so I don't know if there's something that's not chemically. I used isomaceous earth and such uh, to kill them. I have not even studied them. So I would get a hold of a researcher at the university and, and start digging into their life cycle and different things and figure them out. Okay. So the first thing I try to figure out is, okay, what's their life cycle and what's their job? Yeah. All right. Nature's got a job. Everybody's got a job. So if you can figure out what that is, and that not have that job openly available like that. Come over here, the, the job needs done. You don't want to do that. If you can do it the other way, like they go over there and you're over here, so you figure out ways to work with them. So I have not studied that past, so I can't help you, but yes? What's the name of the lab you specifically use for the nutrients of the plants or the one you recommend? For the microbes? Yes, yeah, try to find out where Okay, so for the microbes, if we're going to do a microbe test and we want to find out who and which nematodes we have and how many nematodes we have and all the X, Y, and Z, we do that at Earth Fort. Earth Fort Lab. It's in Oregon, owned by Matt Slater. If we want to just do, uh, we're doing a huge fields, I'm like, well, we don't want to pay $140 a test. Then we're going to send it to Ward Lab and do a Haney test. And they're just going to figure out how many are in your sample from respiratory. So they'll know how much is in there. They will not know who's in there. They just know how many is in there and how much nitrogen they can provide to your plants and stuff. So they'll give you a recommendation. Like say if you're at the NRCS office and you take your stuff into them and they get to report back and they're like, well, it says that you could decrease your your, um, your nitrogen by 50%. And the farmer and the, and the NRCS person are going to look at each other like, should we trust that? 
Like they don't know because they haven't been exposed to it enough and they haven't had enough training to know, yes, you should trust that. Only put 50% of the nitrogen on. Because the second they do more than that, the plant's not using it up. The, the nitrogen the, the, the microbes had available for the plant to use, they're using that too. But there's a big devil's advocate there. We don't have time for that because it's two o'clock. Because when we provide the nitrogen, what's happened to the microbes that was going to provide nitrogen? Not going to be there. All right, so we got to summarize, and I hope you're going to grow healthy. All right, healthy soil will be a healthy life. And thanks for coming. Thank you. All right. <laughs>